Um, I want to introduce Ryan McCarrigan. He is the founder of Lean Studio, which is a product design consultancy that's based here in San Francisco. Ryan has actually um, worked with a number of amazing companies, such as Sandisk, Disney, Techstars, and Singularity. Um, he was, at one point in time, marketing, head of marketing at several startups in New York and San Francisco, including Lean Startup Machine, and he's also the founder of the Corporate Entrepreneurship Meetup and head organizer of the San Francisco chapter of the Columbia Venture Community. So with that, Ryan, please come up on stage and welcome the rest of your panel. Thank you. All right, guys. I'm gonna let these guys introduce themselves. I think that's a little easier. How's everyone doing? Good morning so far? Good? Some nice energy. All right, George. Hi, my name is uh, George Rutsky, and uh, yesterday I pretty much lost my voice, so I have flashcards. Oh. Um, I uh, founded ROI Works uh, Digital uh, about 15 years ago, um, and I periodically leave, take a leave of absence from that uh, consultancy, and go start a startup or uh, join one. Sometimes they fail miserably, sometimes they fail not as miserably. Once in a while they go public, uh, once in a while they get acquired but mostly they just fail miserably, and uh, I really enjoy uh, growth and conversion. Hello, I'm Zach Winisco. Um, I head up growth and marketing at uh, Creative Market, which is recently acquired by Autodesk. I think I work for Autodesk now. Um, I've been working for fast growth startups for over a decade before Creative Market. I co-founded a company called Branch Out. Um, we were notable for growing from uh, to about 30 million users in 90 days back in 2012, one of the fastest growing Facebook apps. Uh, that company is now uh, owned by Hearst. Uh, before that, I worked for a company called Tickle. Um, and Tickle was one of the fastest growing sites in the early 2000s, acquired by Monster. Um, a little over 100 million way back when. So, happy to be here. I'm Laura Klein. Is this better? Yeah. Perfect. Hi, I'm Laura Klein. I am the VP of product at a small seed funded startup called Hint Health. I also wrote a book called UX for Lean Startups. I have been working with startups for many, many years, in fact, through the, the last boom and the current one. And so uh, I always like to say that I've seen a lot of small companies make a lot of the same mistakes, and I like to share those mistakes with other people so that you can all make your own new mistakes. All right, great, thank you guys. Um, this is a really exciting little group we have up here. I think we have a pretty diverse array of experience, so hopefully that'll make for some interesting conversation and some great Q&A at the end. So in the interest of time, I just want to jump right into the questions. Um, so we're going to be talking about lean marketing meets growth hacking and hopefully get some really good tactics and advice out to everybody about how to acquire your first thousand users as quickly as possible. So jumping right in, what do you guys think are some of the best tactics or growth hacks that you're seeing right now for acquiring the first thousand users in early stage companies? Oh, we're starting with me? <laughs> okay. Whoever wants to dive in. Sure. Um, you know, the, I have a strange relationship with growth hacks because I always feel like whichever ones you've heard of aren't going to work for very much longer. So I always like to say that the best, if you're, if you're looking for a new growth hack, something that's actually going to take off and work, you can take an old technique and try to find a new channel and apply it in a new channel. So, you know, there are some people who are trying things on Snapchat and Secret and all sorts of, but you know, like if you, what you're doing is you're reading about things that, you know, Branch Out did in 2012, like that they're interesting, but they probably won't work again. So whatever you see that looks interesting, look at it, try not to copy it, try to move it maybe into a, into a new emerging channel or market. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, 
I think the number one question I get asked a lot is like, what's the silver bullet for, for growth? And there's no such thing. I think it's, uh, when, you, when you launch a new product, you kind of have to identify who your audience is. And rarely is there, is there a product that's a general like social networking product where on day one you're launching viral you know, loop features where you're just gonna go acquire a million users. I mean, this panel is about the first thousand users. It's actually not super difficult to do overnight if you diversify your channels and, and uh, try different, uh, a lot of different things at once. Um, I can give you a couple examples of how you can do this. Um, one is you can export. Sorry. You can export your uh, all your LinkedIn connections uh, through your settings, uh, depending on how many people you're connected to on LinkedIn. That might get you over that thousand uh, user mark overnight. Uh, you can do the same thing on Facebook. All your email addresses for your friends come over there. Um, so start with friends and family first, um, and from there identify communities um, in your niche. Uh, reach out to bloggers. Um, you know, one of the best topics you can do early on, even before you launch a product, is you could do guest posting. You can do guest post. Ah, there it is. All right. Um, so yeah, one of the things you can do is, is just identify bloggers in your space and you know reach out to do guest posting and just talk about not necessarily your product, but uh, you know you could you could do a short mention in there and you know that can help you know get you in front of you know potentially a giant audience in a little uh, small amount of time. So uh, I really agree with Zach. Uh, you should try a bunch of different things, but. I think you should first ask yourself if your product is paid or unpaid. If you have a paid product, um, you can for sure, and you should for sure experiment with paid channels because they're scalable and they're instant, and they also tell you a lot about the demographics and psychographics of your audience. So um, if your product is paid and it's B2C, uh, I recommend the following channels. If you're trying to like do this overnight or like in a week, I would start typically with uh, AdWords, Google Display, Google Remarketing. Make sure that you do Google Remarketing lists, which links up your remarketing to your Google Analytics. That lets you create segmented cookie pools so you can basically do drip marketing to the people who come to your site. It's a very inexpensive way of, let's say you get you know, 500 or 200 visitors a day to your site, or even a week or a month, you can remarket to all of them, not just the ones that you're paying for for AdWords. Um, I like, I recommend uh, Facebook ads. I recommend kind of doing a um, broad targeting initially on Facebook ads, because your budget's probably pretty small, if, if much at all. Um, once you have, um, a minimum number of customers, you can take that list, upload it to Facebook, and create what's known as a custom audience, which will allow you to target, quote, more people like them on Facebook. Um, that's usually the best performing or one of the two best performing campaigns on Facebook. Um, and then the other thing, if you're doing uh, a paid product, um, you can oftentimes consider uh, an ambassador program. An ambassador program early on was used with uh, amazing effect by Chegg. In fact, they scaled it to where it was generating millions of dollars of revenue for them per year. Um, and I, I actually used an ambassador program for a mobile e-commerce social shopping app, kind of like Google Alerts for shopping. And that's exactly the, the tactic that worked best for our first you know, 1,000 to 2,000 customers. Um, because we were getting good customer feedback from these ambassadors. They were, t we had ended up using um, uh, student and business fraternity and business sorority students at uh, San Francisco State, training them and then scaling that. And we had the best engagement from them. We also, they were willing to do focus groups with us. They were willing to recruit other students. So that's what I would probably do if it's a you know, paid product, uh, B2C. B2B is a little different. Uh, we can probably come back to it later in, in the talk. Ryan, what are some of your favorite growth hacks? Good question. Well, I think I, I might want to actually segue into the next question to address that. Because um, I, I think that's a nice overview of sort of how we, we look at possible channels from a high level and, and some channels that we can play around in. But I think that I'd like to bring the discussion a little more towards what are good channels to experiment in quickly. Um, I think what, is, what sort of underpins the title of this talk is this question of how do we quickly acquire a thousand users, but are we doing that in one channel or are we experimenting across as many channels as possible? I think this is something that's interesting to the audience, it's fascinating to me. 
what are some good practices for experimenting across as many channels, but good channels? So maybe, maybe we want to touch on that a little bit. Quick experimentation, quick learning so that we can pivot to channels that perform better than others. So I'll just talk real briefly, but you know, I think one thing that's worth, well, well one is that the, the talk is on first thousand users, and I think that's a whole different beast than your first thousand paying customers. Um, so that, that's, that's something else, but um, you know, when you think about growth, there's three stages really. There's, there's this uh, early product market fit where you're trying to find out if there's, there's a market that's, that's willing to use and pay for your, your product. At the other end, there's a scalable uh, side of growth where you know, you've really figured out SEO or you've figured out you know, PPC to, to uh, scale marketing affo affordably. Um, in the middle is like this, this other stage where you're just ready to experiment in like all these different types of channels and I think it's like infinite. And I think this is where the fun part of growth hacking or lean marketing, whatever you want to call it, um, this is where it becomes really fun and creative in that the sky's the limit. And so, I mean, we can rattle off some, some different tactics. I mean, uh, you know, for one, one example, I just saw uh, Sprig in the BART station the other day, they're passing out free lunches on flyers to everyone that comes up through BART in that morning. How many people commute to San Francisco? Like in one day, you can give, you know, thousands of flyers to potential customers. People are going to bite on that free lunch, and then you just acquired them, you got them on your email list, you know, so that's one example. But I mean, there's, there's thousands of creative solutions like that that we can talk about. But, but these guys. I was going to say, that's actually a fabulous example of what I wanted to talk about, which is that the most important thing I think that you can do is when you're trying to do these quick experiments and find the right channels for you, is you really do, and Zach touched on this earlier, you really do have to understand who your user is. Because until you know, and, and, and sorry, let me, let me just start this off by saying, if you're looking for your first thousand users, they're not everybody. Your product is not for everybody. Your product is not for moms or for women or for technical people. It's got to be a very specific, identifiable market where you could go out and find, you know, 10 people. If you were to go out and just identify 10 people that you think will be in your market, nine of those people would be extremely likely to become your customers. So you really have to know who your customer is. And then once you know who your customer is, it shouldn't be that hard to figure out where they hang out. Are your customers, are your type of customers, do they hang out on LinkedIn? Do they hang out at a college sorority? Are they coming to work on BART? Like, these are things that are much easier to answer when you get away from this idea that like, oh, my market's the world. Um, you just can't do that when you, when, when you get your first thousand users, you want them to be a thousand people who are very similar to one another so that you can actually build a product that makes them happy. Yeah, I, I guess I would agree with both Zach and Laura on this. I'll, you'll probably hear me say this a lot. Um, because um, in, in the beginning, you're really just trying to get a testable platform. A thousand users allows you to test everything from your funnel to engagement to retention um, and to uh, quickly get answers. So it's less important, like if you, you know, discover or you know because of a competitor's success that here's this one amazing channel to get you a thousand users quickly, by all means do that. Um, but more often you're gonna take two to three to four channels and try to test them a little bit while your primary goal initially is to get to that testable platform of a thousand users, right? Because you're just, at, as Zach said, at that early stage, you're just trying to kind of finesse and get into a product market fit situation. So you're not trying to scale and you're not trying to like determine how much total money could I spend on AdWords per year? That's a different question. You're initially just trying to say, who are my users? What do they like? What's their funnel look like? Um, what can I learn from them? How can I make my product better? So that first thousand users, you're at a very early stage. It's very different. So uh, building on this question of how many channels should we go after to acquire that first thousand users, I'd be interested to hear you guys comment on 
the types of channels that you would go after strategically in terms of uh, their potential saturation ceiling. What I mean by that is how many maximum potential users could you acquire per channel? Is it better to take a more diverse uh, approach or if you're, in a, if you're in a hyper growth type of company, do you want to come right out of the gates roaring and just go after those massively scalable channels? What are your thoughts on that? I say you don't start pouring people into the top of the funnel until you're sure that you've plugged up as many holes in the funnel as you can. Don't, don't start pouring a huge number of people into the top of your funnel until your funnel no longer looks like a sieve. Yeah, I think that's, that's so key. And I think the special thing about having a thousand users is that you can go in your database, you're watching the activity, you know these people by first name. You know, the first couple of weeks of your product, you know their behavior, you know their background, their demo small number really and these are the people who are going to help craft your product and make it make it even better for the next thousand users um and just another thing just a note on like at, at the end of the day um marketing is all about word of mouth so whatever channels we go down and and you know experiment with this virality or or seo it, you need to have a product that people love they need to have this product in their life and they have to be willing to uh spend their time using it if you don't get that part right, then you know any scalable channel that you invest in uh, is just going to fail eventually. And so, really, you know, it's so important to spend time during this like thousand user stage to really finesse and, and fine tune your product. I just want to follow up on that really quickly. Um, should we be concerned, or are we concerned that maybe the growth hacking movement, its recent you know time in the sun, is bringing us back to the days of let's just acquire a massive number of users early to impress our investors. Um, I feel like the lean startup movement really kind of came in and rescued us from that type of thinking, at least I hope so. Um, are we seeing people go back to that old kind of thinking or, or does the growth hacking movement strike a, a nice balance? I mean, let's, let's maybe talk about that for a few minutes. Um, so I'll take this one for a sec. Um, I encounter routinely, you know, folks who, you know, will come to me or, or my extended kind of group of folks I work with and, um, you know, behind closed doors, they're talking about needing to meet specific um, vanity metrics. Uh, and probably most of the people in this audience have had that kind of conversation with an entrepreneur. It might have been that entrepreneur who feels that pressure. Um, I would like to really encourage everybody here to try to build a real business. Um, resist the pressure from investors, from press, from colleagues, from your accelerator, uh, if, it's, if it's a crappy accelerator, of course, good ones don't do this, um, to, to provide and generate vanity metrics. Um, determine what your KPIs are and, and determine what stage of development you're in. Um, you know, lean marketing, uh, is just a philosophy, I mean, you could, you know, of, of working on the right thing at the right time and, and expending the right amount of effort. It's like a order of operations, if you will. It's also an experimental mindset, which it shares with growth hacking or whatnot. Um, so try to resist the urge to get yourself to 10,000 users, all of whom look at your product once and never come back, right? You should probably, after a thousand users, you know, have a platform to understand who those people are, zero in on the 100 that seem to be, or the 20 or the five that are crazily engaged, and then try to get your next 9,000 to be closer to that. Um, and, 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 you know, at the end of the day, you don't want to spend three years of your life, maybe five years of your life, building something that is meaningless and does not exist, you know, after you leave it, right? Um, you want to try to build something real, and if, if it's not going to be real, it's much better to just fail and do something else. Uh, be, because, you know, getting, getting that funding round, you know, you'll get the most emails you've ever gotten congratulating you, but when you actually build a business, it takes a while, and, and very few people congratulate you on building a real business. I was also going to say, I've heard a lot of the sort of leaders of growth hacking speak, and they all say the same thing, which is it's a lot easier to grow a good product that people actually want. So, you know, I, I, I want to separate out what the people who 
really believe in growth hacking and I really know what the hell they're talking about are saying about growth hacking versus what maybe some people are using growth hacking to justify something that they were probably going to do anyway, which is, you know, try to grow and, you know, really quickly and, you know, try to sell a, a crappy product. But it's much easier to grow something that people like and want to use. I think that's a really important point to make. Um, it's important that in this context we really understand what growth hackers mean. And I think, I think they do get it. You know, I sort of posed a leading question to see if maybe there were some uh, differing points of view. But, you know, for the most part, I think the growth hacking community has really embraced lean, um, has really embraced understanding your users, making sure that you're building a must-have product that people can't live without before investing all of that time and their personal resources and financial resources, of course, into scaling a product, right? Um, and I think that's a good point to sort of pose the question around UX and what role now is user experience playing in the growth hacking community, in the lean marketing community? How can we leverage UX to build that must-have product before we start doing all of this experimentation with channels and with acquiring our first thousand users? I'll speak generally. Um, I think that um, I think design and UX is more important today than at any time in history on the internet. I think that there was like a watershed in like 2012 where you could you could no longer succeed with a shitty product. You could no longer a, a lousy design product. Um, and I, so I think like you know the landscape just shows like design is definitely very very important. Um, you know, as well as, you know, onboarding and, and, you know, user psychology and, you know, all the things, all the things that go into that. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah, maybe we can separate um, UX research from the user experience for a sec. I think UX research is, is key to growth. Um, and uh, every day, um, like at our shop, we don't do any design work at all until we've actually conducted UX research. You, you should be, uh, if you're you know, a startup person, you should be familiar with uh, Crazy Egg, Qualaroo, Mixpanel, and uh, moderated user interviews. And Silverback is a really great tool for videotaping your users' screen, what they're saying, their facial expression, while they're actually using your product. All of those tools tell you two things. They tell you what users are doing, that's the quantitative stuff, the analytics, and then the UX research tells you why they're doing it, okay? Or maybe why they're not. Then you pour all of that information into your best hypothesis for how you could design and write a better homepage, right? Or a better onboarding experience. That UX research is a way to leap over seven, eight, or nine tests. So instead of having to do, you know, you have very little traffic or very few users uh, in for your product early on. If you can do good, solid UX research, your hypotheses are going to be much better and you're going to get to a winner much quicker. And conversion at every step of your funnel, at every step of your sort of pirate metrics, you know, kind of uh, growth is, is, is key, right? That's how you grow, is you either put more people in the top of the funnel or you basically convert them better at various stages or retain them better. I was gonna say too that um, I wanna remind everybody that UX stands for user experience. So your product has a user experience whether it's intentional or not, whether it's well designed or not. So if you don't have that initial well designed, well thought out user experience, with doing things like researching so that you understand who your customers are and doing usability testing so you understand whether or not people understand what your product does or how to use it. If you don't do any of those things, then what you're gonna end up with is a lot of acquisition and very little conversion. And what you, will, what you have to remember is that if you can actually convert the people that you acquire, again, you will grow much faster than if you acquire a bunch of people for five minutes and then they leave. So the user experience, user experience is, 
it's not just that it's more important, it's that it is the entire experience that your user has with your product, and if you do a bad job at that, nobody will come back. So it's incredibly important um, for growth hacking, for acquisition, but just for you know building a, a company and a product. Yeah, I'd, I'd just add too that I did go on the design tangent, but user experience is it's support, it's it's you know the the PR and, and the, it's the whole company uh, is that user experience. Yeah, if you think about like Uber, right? The, the user experience of Uber, what you know, however you feel about it, is you know, it yes, it's the app, but it's also the experience in the car, and it's also the experience, uh, you know, of you know, if you have a problem and you you have a conversation with a customer service person, it's it's that entire experience. It's not just the experience isn't necessarily just that app. It's the experience later on when you tell somebody, oh, how'd you get here? Oh, I took an Uber. You know, it's that whole thing. I would add, I like to think that user experience begins from the moment of exposure. When you first hear the name of the brand and you wonder, what is that? What do they do? To actually seeing it. It's not just immersion. It's not actually playing with the product or sitting in the car, experiencing it uh, that way. It is literally from the first moment of exposure. If you think about it in those terms, then that elevates the importance of really nailing who your target customer is and, and making sure that you're sourcing the right first thousand users, not just anybody. There were a couple words that were thrown out. Um, hypotheses was mentioned by George and, and metrics was mentioned a couple of times. And I think in our remaining five minutes, it would be nice to try to distill everything that we've discussed into some more tactical advice for how we actually plan our hypotheses and define our metrics and actually engage in this process of experimentation in, in trying to acquire our first thousand users. What kind of planning do we do? How long does that planning take? What does it look like? Maybe how does it change from uh, B2B to B2C? I'll just let you guys run with that. I, so before I run any test, any test at all, whether it's qualitative or quantitative, anything, I decide what am I trying to learn? And then I try to pick the right test for learning that. And then the other thing that I have to do is I have to say, how will I know whether this, you know, if I'm, val if I'm validating an assumption, if I've, if I've said, I believe X to be true, let's see if I'm right. How will I know if I'm wrong? So I need to actually have a metric that I can measure um, you know, for running the test. I have to have a valid way of running the test. It's kind of like science. <laughs> but uh, more fun, I think. Um, so you have, but you have to know what you want to learn, and you have to have a way, a quantitative way of knowing when you will learn it, or when you have proven it to be untrue. Yeah, one of the things that we, um, that I've always done is is bring the team into a room, and we put all the ideas of of growth tactics on on the board, and we rank everything by how many humans is it going to take to build this feature how much effort, and what's the perceived impact to the company. Um, and then we could stack rank all that, and then we have a pretty good list, of, a prioritized list of, of what we think is gonna move the needle in the shortest amount of time. Um, that's really the goal, I think, with a startup, is that you have this, this finite stretch of time before you either become profitable, run out of money, go bankrupt, or you raise another round. And so it really is a race to that, to that milestone, and so prioritization is, is super critical. Yeah, um, I wanted to come back to um, one thing I mentioned about qualitative and quantitative data being really important in forming your hypothesis. Um, so pro just on a blocking and tackling level, nine out of 10 companies that kind of, I've looked into their Google Analytics, they're not instrumented properly. Uh, and, and definitely same thing goes for Mixpanel. Um, in fact, I don't know, a couple months ago, I was looking inside of a actual analytics software company's analytics, and it was not instrumented properly. The data they were getting was incorrect. This is a funded company, right? I won't get into who or what. Um, so, uh, myself and a couple other guys, we redid their analytics, and then we actually found 
uh, that having re-instrumented it, a lot of the conclusions they were making about what users were using, forget about why, because that's more squishy sometimes, were incorrect. So the first thing you want to do is figure out what does the funnel actually really look like across devices, across channels, over time, day of week, time of day, by gender. Look at that because you're going to find segments of users that behave really differently. Then you're going to see, to Zach's point, what is the most impactful thing you could do with the least amount of effort to improve conversion, which improves growth, right? Then what you do is you, you simply go over and, and do a little bit of uh, user testing and customer development to understand why that segment of customers is doing things. Then you form your hypothesis around what copy or design or layout or, or funnel flow is going to improve things. That, that would be the order of operations I would use to kind of rationally allocate your time because as Zach said, you know, time is your most precious commodity. And uh, just before we start Q&A in a moment, I would, I would add to what George said and say that analytics tools are very good at telling you what someone did, keyword what, and we can infer uh, what segment they represent by looking at those behaviors uh, in our analytics, but we don't know why they did them. We need to go back to those users, do customer development, and figure out what are their needs and goals. What are their underlying motivations? What are their underlying pain points? And that's how we define what our market segments are. Okay, so um, thanks for those questions, guys. I think we're gonna do Q&A now for 10 or 15 minutes? 15. 15, okay. All right, and, and how do we wanna run Q&A? Uh, are there microphones in the audience or? Okay, great. All right, so questions from the audience. How you doing, uh, Andrew Hill um, from Berkeley? I just wanted to follow up on the B2B recommendations. I know we mentioned B2C and we said we'd get back to it, so I'd love to hear more about that. Um, sure, so getting your first thousand B2B customers is actually definitely not an overnight thing. Um, it's something I actually did for a SaaS product called My Next Customer since closed down, but uh, it was sort of like uh, a misguided attempt to uh, offer all the features of Omniture for like 900 to 1,000 bucks a month. Um, anyway, I was able to get to 1,000 customers with, with that startup and ran it as like a lifestyle business for about three and a half years. Um, and the, the channels that worked best for me initially were um, signing up my first three or four customers and getting amazing testimonials from them, even though I was willing to do it for free. So um, I remember um, when I first started doing my next customer, um, I went out to lunch with Parker Harris, the co-founder of Salesforce, and I was like, hey, what did you guys do? You know, this is an amazing thing you guys did. He said, look, we gave away a bunch of free software initially to get that fir those first customers, and the more prominent they were, the more we gave them for free. So give it away for free initially to get your testimonials, get those logos for social proof on your website. Right? Um, then um, I would definitely try to um, leverage your network to get people to do free trials of your software uh, and, and probably uh, use AdWords uh, and uh, LinkedIn and then remarketing to kind of generate lead flow. So. I would add to that. So, so I think you know, B2B is always a tough nut to crack. Um, regardless of whether you're doing B2B customer discovery for a product that hasn't fully been built or you're, you're doing sales for a product that exists, it's really hard to get your foot in the door with B2B. And I, and I would even go so far as to say that that's a completely different beast than, than most of what we've addressed today on stage. I think we're, we're, we're not really in the B2B realm in the context of growth hacking. Um, there are certainly hacks. I think that the key with B2B is really doing a great job of, first of all, finding your point of entry into a company and then figuring out, am I talking to the buyer, the influencer, the decision maker, the end user? You have to fundamentally understand that at least. And then if you're doing customer discovery for a product that doesn't exist yet, don't go in with the idea that that conversation will be transactional. You're not gonna close a big sale doing, doing any kind of B2B 
uh, customer discovery interview. You're there to learn as much as you can about their pain points, about what competitors they've looked at. So it's a completely different beast. And of course, there's a much longer sales cycle. So we're not talking about acquiring someone overnight. We're probably talking about months of nurturing. So it's not transactional. It's a months long process of asking questions and figuring out what their, what their real need is. That, that's very true, but the, the one thing that I do want to say is that there's B2B and then there's B to large B. Um, so, like right now, the product that I'm working on is, I, I call it B2D because it's business to doctors, but uh, there's, there are definitely, there are your little single practitioner practices and then there are, you know, Stanford Hospital, right? And selling into those two different markets is, those are 100% different. Right, those are not. That's as different as customer or as, as consumer to you know small business. So if you're a startup, seed funded, you may find that even if your eventual goal is you know to sell to IBM or, or to sell to GE, you may want to start smaller and understand the needs. Now I will say the great thing about B two B products is you're actually typically solving a serious hard problem for people that people will pay you to solve so i want to encourage everybody to do it but you might also like i said you might want to start at the smaller or or with smaller divisions within larger companies you don't go straight at trying to sell to you know i'm going to sell to all of ge good luck with that so a uh, good point more questions yeah uh so laura uh this, this question to you i, I love that you said uh, you shouldn't think of, uh, very good. <laughs> so I love that you said, uh, you know, you, you shouldn't think of y your users in broad strokes, so all moms or all 25 year olds, etc. Uh, but do you think it's ever acceptable, you know, for a product to genuinely have a, uh, you know, genuinely be catering to multiple psychographic, demographic profiles, and in which case, you know, where do you start? How do you even try to start building something that can appeal to, you know, different groups of people, or people in different psychographic programs? You start with one. That's how you get to multiple. I think, um, can I maybe try to rephrase the question? Sure. I, I think from what I was able to hear, and I have a, a fan in my ear up here, what I hear is um, how, how much time should we invest in actually building a psychographic profile? Uh, how much time should we invest in that kind of research before we start? Maybe, Laurie, maybe you heard better. <laughs> I, I don't have fan. I think it was, um, is it okay to sell to multiple groups? Because I, I often say you want a very tight, narrow focus on the group of people. I agree. Is it okay to say, oh no, but my product's really for like multiple groups of people? Um, having built marketplaces, where marketplaces by definition have two very different sets of users, they have buyers and sellers, um, I will tell you that marketplaces are probably the hardest thing to build, honestly, because you are building for two such very different groups of people. So if you're thinking about aiming at three or four different groups of people, I would say that the way to get something that appeals to three or four types of people is to start with one type of people. I, I like to think of it in terms of this framework, and you, you can probably search for some, some nice graphics online uh, that kind of illustrate this, but you have your total addressable market. Okay, so imagine there's a cloud in the sky. That is your total addressable market. You might have five, six, seven market segments that eventually you can sign up to be your customer. But we don't begin by trying to address all of them. We want to go for what we believe, for what we hypothesize will be our strongest use case, our most viable early customer. And not only that, but we're going to go for the early adopters in that particular market segment. Early adopter has the problem, is aware they have the problem, is searching for a solution. If you're lucky, you even find people who have hacked together their own solution. They, those are people that are really foaming at the mouth, as we say, for some sort of solution. And they have budget to pay you to solve their pain. Um, so it's always best to start with a very specific niche and to define that market segment in as specific terms as possible. Uh, just to add one thing to what Ryan said, in order to help you define what that niche is, 
um, actually start out broad. But when I say start out, I'm saying take a day to three days to figure out what that niche will be. So check this out. Take your basic value proposition, right? Create, um, create a couple of banners, create the groups you think you might be targeting, maybe not, but start with the generic value proposition. Run it on display, run it on Facebook. Both Google Display and Facebook will tell you how men, women, people of different ages, people who are parents, people who aren't, all the psychographic demographic data that you need to tell you who clicked through to that value proposition at the highest rate will be available to you within two days. So that can actually help you decide to do what Ryan and Laura recommend, which is to focus on a couple of areas. But you can, in a very lean, quick and dirty way, you don't have to build your product. Just do the value proposition and a landing page and test it. That's it. All right. Uh, great advice. Looks like we have time for just one more question. All right, one more. Who will it be? Uh, this guy, I think, has been itching to ask a question. I was actually sitting in the background. Okay, let's do two questions. All right, two, we'll do two, two more. Two quick questions. I might be fairly quick. I work for an advertising agency, and a lot of the things that you're talking about is what we do. What we're finding is that we're also looking at competitive data, seeing what's actually working for the competitor, what are the markets that are driving the most amount of referrals, the most amount of conversions, how much they're spending on ad advertising. What kind of tools or data, if you are doing this kind of like pre-optimizing your campaigns or knowing what's working or what isn't, what tools are you using and how are you, monetize, how are you showing that they're successful? I think there's some, you know, Moz, SEM Rush, there's some tools, look at competitive data, competes, um, there's some tools out there. Um, and then there's also, you know, if you want to be, you know, clever, you can also do some things like use import IO, which, you know, you can scrape competitive uh, website public profiles and then compile data that way and slice and dice that and, and figure out all kinds of signals there. Um, but there, there are a ton of competitive analysis tools out there. Um, and even, I mean, some like Import.io, their website has so many examples of how you can use scrape data to, to run analysis on, on competition. It's pretty interesting. I think it's a good answer. I would just add SpyFu to that list. Um, and and uh, also, it's not a competitive tool, but it, it's actually an amazing tool to help you figure out where, what, what's happening in your market. Uh, use Google uh, Insights, right? Search Insights to see what people are searching on. One of the fun things that, that I did uh, about a year and a half ago is, uh, was kind of looking at what services and what type of consulting people needed more. And conversion rate optimization was going kind of, you know, like this. And, uh, you know, SEO was going kind of like that. So that's a good insight for, for me and my consulting company. And you can do the same for your market. And before we just uh, get to the last question, I just wanted to add that we have a dedicated presentation to competitive intelligence today. You guys don't want to miss it. It's going to be great. Now let's, let's just take one last question from the audience. Sure. Thank you. Uh, I did hear about the free webinars, right? Th those are the ones which kind of bring you a lot of the people on the initial. So do you guys think that works, like giving out a lot of content, a lot of education content through free webinars? What's your thought on that? So you're talking about audience building and you know giving out blogs and yeah. or doing blogs and webinars and yeah that kind of thing. Yeah, to get those I, yeah. thousand users. Yeah, I think it works exceptionally well in certain types of markets. Again, I think for example, um, if you're in a market that uh, Mint is sort of the classic example of the blog information, right? It's a complicated thing. People are looking for experts who can help them understand finances. Um, it's the kind of thing where there's lots and lots of content around it that people are already searching for. So yeah, in those kinds of products, um, doing webinars and email uh, newsletters and blogs and giving away free content can be very effective. I think, you know, if you're doing a social network that is more about connecting people not around any particular topic, right, it, probably less so. You know, I. I don't know that Sprig is going to, you know, give away a lot of content. They might give away food, which would be a very different kind of thing. I, I would say that content is interesting in, in really two strategical uh, ways. One is for conversion, and so if you are giving away something that's high value on on your homepage in order to get that email address, I mean, getting people to sign up for a, 
for an email address is there's a lot of hesitation and, and friction there alone, let alone filling out an entire user profile, any other additional information you want to get. And so if you can give away a valued ebook or any kind of like free goods as an incent, then you know there's there's something to, to play with there. Um, and I think on the other side of content and blogging just in general is that there's a way for you to kind of hack uh, SEO in that you can start to write around you know high search volume stuff that uh, may be competitive where your your organic uh, search it, you know your competitors are killing you there on basic product pages or whatever it might be, you can write about a certain subject and kind of get around uh, those other uh, competitive uh, results, so. All right, thank you so much. Let's give a round of applause for our growth and lead marketing efforts.